guys, I just put together the best supercut you're ever going to see. And it is of old Donnie getting utterly raked over the coals on camera in a bunch of interviews and reports. But it culminates in his rally being shut down by progressive protesters, brave protesters, pointing out that this absolutely monstrous clown show cannot continue and this man has no business being president again or having any sort of power so hit the like and subscribe button it's the single most important thing you can do to help me out and to spread our message beyond the bubble and guys watch all of this because it starts with him getting humiliated on the news and then he thinks to himself well i've been humiliated all day by joe biden and everybody else at least i can have a fun rally where my cult cheers for me and he didn't even get that tonight Reporting from Jonathan Lemire, because it does show a level of personal animosity. Quote, the president has described Trump to longtime friends and close aides as a sick expletive who delights in others' misfortunes, according to three people who have heard the president use the profane description. According to one of the people who has spoken with the president, Biden recently said of Trump, what a uh, another expletive guy right. uh candidates who don't like each other isn't anything new we can agree on that <laughs> but but this is very personal and very deep and i wonder against an opponent for whom there have never been any boundaries right with, with uh right. donald trump could channeling this anger actually help joe biden Look, you know, uh, there are two things to take away from this reporting by Jonathan. The first is this was a conversation he had with private friends, among friends. He wasn't standing at a podium, as we've seen Donald Trump uh, do in recent weeks, and profanely describe uh, others uh, and, and, and aspects of this election. So that's one. Number two. Uh, Donald Trump is given credit and, and props for speaking for MAGA. Well, guess what? Joe Biden speaks for the rest of us. So I'm not, I don't have a problem with that characterization because I think it's accurate personally. Um, and, and so the fact that the president uh, feels this way, uh, it, I think uh, is a reflection of how a lot of Americans feel. And, and he speaks for a lot of Americans um, in, in, in that regard. So um, it's not a public statement. It's not you know, said from the presidential podium. It is a conversation he's had with others. Those others chose to share that with, with as a source for Jonathan. That's okay. But I'm not all worked up about it. Uh, in fact, I'm like, okay, thank you. <laughs> you just confirmed for me what I think. Uh, and a lot of Americans think that way. So if Donald Trump can speak for MAGA, I think it's okay for Joe Biden to speak for the rest of us. Yeah, Admiral, I don't usually ask you about politics, or at least not directly, but this is someone whose own chief of staff, John Kelly, confirmed that Trump described dead U.S. service members as losers and suckers because there was nothing in it for them. Can that person, in your view, be trusted to effectively lead the U.S. military, especially at such a dangerous time? I think anyone who has served in the military, and by the way, John Kelly is a lifelong friend of mine. We served together as junior officers. Um, as you probably know, John Kelly lost a son in combat, um, and he knows that his son is not a sucker. His son is not a loser. The president's son, uh, Bo Biden, served very honorably in combat, later died of cancer in, in Walter Reed in the, in the nation's military hospital, correctly so. Uh, at the end of the day, those kind of comments, in my view, um, will hurt Donald Trump significantly uh, with the military, with veterans and with retirees. Um, I say this as a proud retiree, 37 years in the armed forces. We are not suckers. We are not losers. We are patriots. And I don't want to conflate the political fight with what we're seeing today, but I don't want to let you go either, Admiral, without asking you, because it is important to honor those who have made the ultimate sacrifice to protect their country. Uh, Ronald McDaniel getting on air to be like, you need to drop out. There was a move for a resolution, like not even pretending any neutrality. And of course, again, this is the vision that he has for all politics, like that yes. I win, heads I win, tails you lose. Absolutely. You can see how he has reshaped just about every aspect of the electoral system. The voters are different 
now. Yeah. Uh, the the local officials are different now. The candidates are different now. But almost nowhere is it more stark than in the party apparatus itself. And it's for the exact point that you and Sarah have both made. If you make your litmus test absolute fealty to an unhinged racist weirdo, guess what kind of people you get? That's what's stacked top to bottom now. And at some point, like, I usually chafe when we're like, Donald Trump is so new and different and he's totally remade the Republican Party. And it's like, nah, you can trace this back to Newt Gingrich and Lee Atwater right, and yeah. sowing the seeds that would eventually get you the kind of racist, unhinged autocrat that Donald Trump is. I think where the Republicans didn't necessarily lay the groundwork for it is in such a grifter. I don't think they ever well, expected that. that somebody like that was going to come in and then scoop up all of their small dollars for his own legal fees to pay his own I criminal. Mean, I mean, well, that's the thing about the, the money, right? right? So, I mean, one of the things, Sarah Long, Sarah, is that the you know, parties have gotten weaker um, over time. Partly that's because they can only raise as hard as money, and so the combination of you know McCain-Feingold plus Citizens United means the super PACs can raise unlimited amounts of money. You've got this whole different structure. The parties, both parties, have less financial relevance. But it's also like there is one-to-one -one displacement happening here. I think the RNC raised, if I'm not mistaken, like $80 million last year, and Trump had 50 in legal fees. That's like, I mean, those dollars, it's, it is a fixed pie. Like there's a certain amount of small dollar Republican conservative donors. There's a certain amount of money that's going to come flowing in. And right now, 50 mil yoink into the legal fees. I've got bad news for them. It's about to get worse. I mean, yes. the guy is going to be in court the entire time that they are trying to raise money to run races with. And, and it's not Donald Trump's not the only person in the Republican Party, right? They have Senate races. They have down ballot races. There's a lot of other people who are hoping to have money. And that's what has always been so crazy to me about the Republican Party in a normal world and in a healthy political environment they would be upset with him about this, about draining resources for the betterment of the party. But that's always been the thing about Donald Trump. He doesn't care about the Republican Party. And the less he cares about the Republican Party, the more desperately they are trying to, right. you know, help him and do whatever they can for him, always to the detriment of the party, certainly to the detriment of any kind of principle or, you know, meaningful, um, ideological, you know, <laughs> place a, like thing that they want to do. It's just all about Trump. They're not going to have a platform. Uh, they're not going to be able to raise money for their Senate candidates. They're just going to go all in on Trump. That's the only game in town anymore. It is the whole Republican Party. And Republicans have nobody to put to blame but themselves because they let this happen. They could have stood up a million different times in a yep. million different ways. They chose not to. And that's why we're here. Well, and to Sarah's point, Jess, I mean, you know, as a veteran of, of campaigns and politics, like resources really do matter and they matter the more the lower down you get. Yes. Right. So like when you're talking about, you know, presidential campaigns, it's like these are people with very high name recognition. Mm -hmm. The marginal dollar matters less. When you're talking about a contested house race, like right. it matters a lot. And again, he's going to face more legal troubles this year. He's already got eighty three million dollars. He's got to pay Eugene Carroll. Could be two hundred million plus from New York. We'll see and then actually paying his lawyers. And he, the one thing he's gotten great at is small dollar donors off his legal fees. That is going to suck up even more of that money. Well, that's his strategy. His strategy is to use every bit of legal liability that he has to raise small dollar donations. And you're absolutely right about how important that is lower down the ballot. If you have $10 to send to a, a, a political candidate, send it to a state legislative race. Right. It will matter. It's a yeah. drop in the bucket for a presidential. Yeah. So he is, he's just siphoning off everything that would possibly be able to help rebuild the Republican Party right. if and when he steps off of the stage. Um, he's going to make sure that he leaves it just an absolute abject wasteland. Yeah. Is this a result of your Republican colleagues being too dependent on that right wing uh, media bubble that they just live in, basically just hearing this nonsense over and over, believing it? And then when they go into the real world, they realize there's no evidence to back it up. I think that's right. I mean, look, first, James Comer, you know, spends every minute of every day on Fox News uh, spreading lies and misinformation uh, to his extremist base. I mean, he's at the point where he actually just believes all his own lies now. Uh, every single week, he puts forward some type of new committee hearing on uh, 
a, a fake set of lies or he brings forward witnesses um, that uh, have, have really nothing to say or to add to, to this entire sham. Um, we have just heard recently he has tried to uh, allege that friends of Hunter Biden's are somehow funneling him money. We know that's not true. Uh, he doesn't even want to hear Hunter Biden in a public setting um, kind of answer their questions. And so uh, Republicans, and you're starting to see it now, and some of them are going public, have no confidence in James Comer. We, we know that James Comer is a liar and ineffective, but we also know that he's trying to create something out of nothing. Uh, th- we have moved far beyond this impeachment. It, this, it's a t- complete political stunt. And this is all about helping Donald Trump. It's all about Marjorie Taylor Greene, who on day one of Uh, President Biden's presidency was already submitting impeachment papers uh, and she's on this committee. So she's she's driving this clown car in this train. I'm just glad that the American public are seeing that it's going nowhere. It's interesting. Until I got indicted, I never talked this way about him. You probably know until I got who is this? Is he a friend? You can get him out of here. Get out of here. Get out of here. Go ahead, you can throw them out. that politics is getting serious. So now we know we're getting serious now. He's just a disturbed person. Remember that used to happen all the time. People used to call for it. Where is that? We want it back. But no, probably we're we're really now into political season and that is happening. It's happening. And the people in this room know what any probably knows too. And a lot of those guys, by the way, are paid by Soros and these people. You know that. They're troublemakers. A lot of those people are paid. They go outside. In fact, they're MAGA people, but they can't help it. They say, look, you gave me so-. I said, do what you're doing. This is only happening, all of this, because all of the weaponization, because we're leading so much in the polls, especially if you look, we're leading her by a lot. Ron is probably finished. He's probably finished.